for today's edition of Eritrea Express uh, Media. We have Dr. Nate uh, Domini. Um, if you've noticed the latest uh, article, so I've invited him to, uh, to talk about his later uh, latest article. So without further ado, I want to welcome Dr. Nate. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> yeah. uh, nice, nice seeing you, Nate. Can you just uh, tell us briefly about yourself? You know where you were born, where you grew up. Uh, <laughs> Where you went to school? What are you doing now? Yeah, my name is uh, Nathaniel Dominey. I'm the um, Charles Hansen Professor of Anthropology and Biological Sciences at Dartmouth College. My research is focused on primate behavior and ecology. I'm, I'm really interested in uh, the things that animals eat. And so most of my research revolves around dietary behavior, how animals detect food, how they use their anatomy to select food, and then ultimately assimilate resources from that food uh, during digestion. So every stage of the feeding process uh, holds interest for me. And I think most aspects of primate evolution, including human evolution, are in some way tied to um, the challenge of eating enough food in a given day. Um, so that's the, the core nature of who I am and in, in, in my research. And I, uh, I grew up in uh, Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Uh, I went to Johns Hopkins University for my undergraduate degree. Uh, then I did a PhD at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, and then I did a postdoc at the University of Chicago. My first faculty position uh, was at uh, the University of California at Santa Cruz. And then I moved to Dartmouth College in, uh, in 2010. So I've been here for uh, close to 11 years now. So when you, when you did your first research, you were at the University of Santa Cruz. I mean, when I met you, you were at the University of uh, California, Santa Cruz. Yes, yes. Um, when you moved to Dartmouth, uh, I had a chance to go to New Hampshire, and I spent the night uh, with your wonderful family. So <laughs> that's right. Yeah, we went to, uh, there was a festival. What, what kind of festival was it what that we went to and spent the day? It was a hot air balloon festival called hot the air balloon yeah. festival, yeah. <laughs> called the Quichi Balloon Festival. The Quichi, that's right. I was yeah. trying to remember the name Quichi. Yeah, yeah. Well, the first time I met you actually was when you wrote the, I guess it was the first article about the the Punt, the land of Punt, in the in the research that you did. Uh, yes. Presented it here in, in, in the Auckland area, and this is the second time or I don't know if you have written in between those. So just to start with, uh, what's the difference between the one you wrote the first time when I met you and this time? The article that you wrote is, uh, is for scientific audience, but uh, mm -hmm. to make it uh, as plain as, as simple as possible would be appreciated. Well, when we first met about, uh, about 10 years ago, I had some very preliminary results based on hair from a mummified baboon uh, that was discovered in Egypt, but is now accessioned in the British Museum in London. And so I was able to sample some hairs from that mummified specimen and use oxygen stable isotopes, which is essentially a, a chemical signature that reflects the kinds of water that an animal drinks. And baboons have to drink water every day. They're what we call obligate drinkers. And so their body tissues tend to reflect the chemical composition of the water that they drink. And water varies as a function of elevation and aridity in terms of its oxygen composition. So the hair on your body right now, Isaias, reflects the water you've been drinking in the Oakland area. Whereas my hair, or what's left of it, <laughs> is reflective <laughs> of uh, uh, New Hampshire and Vermont, which is, which is where I am uh, right now. My house is in Vermont, uh, but I work in, in New Hampshire. And so that was our very first attempt, was to look at that one stable isotope, oxygen, in hair of one specimen. And then over the years, what we've been able to do is get bone samples and teeth samples from different mummified specimens. And those tissues uh, are a bit different because you can get some uh, elements that uh, preserve in the mineral of your, of your teeth, for example. And one of those is strontium. And strontium is incorporated by your body when you're eating the food and water on the landscape at the time the mineral is forming. So the enamel on your teeth formed when you were about two years old. And so the strontium of your bones and your, your skeleton replaces itself every 10 years. So your bones have a strontium composition that reflects living in the Oakland area, but your teeth reflect the strontium composition of wherever you were when you were about two years old. And so that difference is really telling. And I can 
tell if I were to measure the strontium in your teeth, I could probably pinpoint at least a few candidate areas on the earth where you might've been living when you were two. And so that was the approach we took with uh, these mummified baboons in London is we were able to measure strontium and their bones and their teeth. And that really helped. And the good thing is that it corroborated the answer we got from using strontium uh, was very similar to the answer that we got using oxygen. And so at the end of the day, we decided to combine those two different isotope signatures and show that the mummified baboons in, uh, in the British Museum came from somewhere in the Horn of Africa. Um, so we think it came from Eritrea, which I think is the most likely candidate. Um, but the data suggests that Somalia is still a possibility. So we couldn't we couldn't rule out Somalia. So yeah, so we did a lot of a lot of additional work uh, over the ten years uh, since we've known each other, um, and the answer kept pointing in the same place, <laughs> which was uh, Eritrea. So in order to understand or value um, your research, what was what's the importance of the land of Punt? Uh, you know, why is it important for to, to to study it now, and why was it important for the ancient Egyptians also to put? ancient Egyptian, the work of ancient Egyptians in, in the context of, you know, like world civilization, why is it important to study ancient Egypt? Why is it important to study, you know, the ancient Punt or the land of Punt? So the ancient Egyptians had tremendous, placed tremendous value on Punt. They, um, they viewed it as a, a land of marvels. Uh, so highly valuable luxury goods like uh, incense, ebony, ivory, uh, shorthorn cattle. There was a very special breed of cattle that they valued that um, was raised in Punt. Um, baboons, of course, uh, leopard skins, uh, rhinoceros even. So there were plants and animals and mineral wealth, gold and electrum that they value tremendously um, uh, from Punt. So they also referred to Punt as living within or as existing within God's land. So there's this tremendous value and respect that they uh, assign to, to Punt. And the important thing to note about the Egyptians is typically when they wanted resources, they would go to war to get those resources, but they never did that with the Puntites. Uh, instead, they sent ambassadors and diplomats. Uh, these were uh, uh, envoys that went to Punt to negotiate peaceful commerce. So many scholars view the Egyptian Puntite relationship as the origins of international peaceful maritime commerce in global history. It, it also lasted for over a millennium, for about 1,100 years, this trading relationship existed. So it's not only the first such relationship, it was also the longest lasting in human history. So it was tremendously important. Um, scholars describe that, that, that pathway between Egypt and Punt as the first long steps in the spice route. Uh, the first long maritime steps in what would eventually become the spice route, which of course shaped geopolitical fortunes for millennia ever since. So many and other scholars just put it more simply and say the beginning of global economic interconnectedness, economic globalization began with that Egyptian punt relationship. It is a, a really important milestone in human history. And it's been uh, tremendously frustrating that, <laughs> that uh, it's been difficult to pinpoint where it was for, for the last 150 years or so. That's how long scholars have been debating the location of punt, um, which, which is a testament to how important it is. So what makes punt elusive in terms of its location? I mean, so the Egyptians, there's two kinds of records of punt. The Egyptians left reliefs and they left paintings. So we have uh, images or iconographic um, representations of punt. And people are depicted, animals and plants are depicted. And we can use those clues to try to get at a location for punt. The Egyptians also left written records. And when you look at the writ written records, you get a slightly different perspective. And the written records really emphasize uh, an Eastern location. And so the only commonality between the images and the written records is that Punt lay south and east of Egypt, and it was accessible by land or sea. That's the only thing we can really agree on uh, uh, in terms of the Egyptian um, descriptions of Punt. And so that's why scholars have, been, have been debating about whether Punt was on the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen, potentially, or whether it was in Somalia proper, or whether it was in Eritrea, or some combination of both of those regions. Uh, some scholars have even argued that Uganda was the location of Punt, or even Mozambique. Um, so there's been quite a 
variety of competing hypotheses for its location, but it's all based on the same kind of evidence and just people are interpreting it in slightly different ways. I mean, it's no surprise that all these different countries are claiming them because it's, it's considered lands of God's land. So yes, any country would, would claim them. You went to Eritrea, right? Like, how many years ago was that? Uh, I went twice, um, once in 2010, and then once during the conference, which was in- the, to, to 2016. 2016, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah you, you presented a paper there, yes. yeah. Um, and you went to Adulis um, both times or one time? Uh, Just the second time in 2016, yes. 16, yeah. Um, so how can you relate um, the African Red Sea, uh, Red sea Coast, and particularly Adulis, and what has been referred to as the advent of globalization? You mentioned also in ancient Egypt. Yes. How can you, how can you contribute to the discussion of Hunt? Well, um, Attalus, as you know, was a, a major uh, important site in antiquity and the Romans described Attalus and they also described baboons as being exported from Attalus. Um, so Attalus, I think is a tremendously important site. And as you know, archeologists have been working there, um, but my understanding, and this is what I learned at the conference is that they stop at the Roman level. So once the archeological level depicts Roman goods, that's where the digging stops. And so one thing I hope that happens from this research is that maybe archeologists will start to go deeper because I think the history that's older than the Roman history could be potentially very, very uh, interesting and rewarding. So um, I think Atlas is a, is, a, is a really likely candidate spot for, for where the Punt Emporium was. So the thing to remember is that the Egyptians recognize Punt as both a kingdom as a, as a region, a sovereign region, but they also talked about the, the port. So there was a major market or emporium there where goods were being exchanged. And so um, I think Atlas is a tr you know, it's an exciting possibility for where the, the port was and you know, whether we'll ever find direct evidence of that port site, I don't, I don't know. But, um, but I think we can start to narrow down where the larger kingdom uh, was. When it comes to land of Punt, the Pharaoh had shifted as mentioned uh, many times. What's her significance? She um, was the first Pharaoh during the New Kingdom period to resume trade with Punt. So uh, there had been envoys to Punt during the Middle Kingdom period, and then there was a very long lull, a very long absence of trade primarily due to conflict between the Egyptians and the Nubians. Uh, there was regular conflict between them. Uh, eventually during the New Kingdom period, there was this major military expedition into Nubia. M most of Nubia fell to the Egyptians and the Egyptians exerted control. And, uh, and then after that point, uh, Queen Hatshepsut was able to resume trade with Punt. So that's one of the reasons why we can rule out Sudan as a potential location for Punt because they never talk about Nubia and Punt in the same way. They always talk about um, their military expedition to Nubia and then that allows them to resume formal trade with, with Punt. So during the New Kingdom period, she was the first Pharaoh to resume trade. It continued with Tutmos the uh, third and then uh, Ramses the third. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, with Ramses III, that's the last mention we have for Punt. And then you have about a thousand years uh, until you have the Greeks and Romans that are in Egypt, and then they start talking about Attalus. Mm -hmm. And so it's awfully tempting to think that Punt and Attalus were essentially the same place, but they just had different names at these different points in history. I, you know, I don't know if that's true. That would, that's a uh, speculation, but uh, it, it, it kind of makes sense in my mind. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. So how about the role of baboons and what, what is the symbolic significance of baboons? So the Egyptians revered baboons, and this is one of the puzzling things about Egyptian religion, is that um, many of their gods are represented as animals. So uh, the jackal, for example, the falcon, uh, the hippo, um, but all of these animals live in Egypt then and now. Uh, the, the baboon is puzzling because the baboon does no longer lives in Egypt. And as far as we can tell, it has never lived in Egypt. The, the, the Holocene fossil record of Egypt is completely devoid of baboons. 
And so this, this reverence for baboons, which lasted throughout the entirety of Egyptian history, from pre-dynastic times all the way up to the Greek and Roman period, the Ptolemaic era, that's, that's a 3,000 year stretch. <laughs> um, they always, always viewed baboons as these sacred animals. And they were the manifestation of Thoth, um, the, the god of wisdom and the god of, of the moon. And so uh, this is just really uh, an anomalous kind of thing because typically in Africa, Baboons are not highly regarded animals. They, they typically raid your crops. They're considered a pest or a nuisance. So it's very unusual that any culture would elevate baboons to such an exalted status. And so there's been a lot of speculation about why the Egyptians might have revered baboons so much. And, and one of the ideas is that baboons in the morning, the baboons will orient their bodies toward the rising sun to warm their bellies. This is called sun basking or sunbathing behavior. And we see it in, in a variety of primates. And it's possible that baboons vocalize at that time, that they issue a very distinct call called the wahoo call toward the rising sun. And so it's been argued that maybe the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians witnessed this behavior firsthand. They saw baboons greeting the morning sun, which is precisly what the Egyptians themselves did. It was, this, was, this was part of their religious practice. And so it's possible that this natural behavior of baboons resonated very deeply with the Egyptians' own religious beliefs. And that's the reason why they revered this animal, because it was also greeting the rising sun as they would do. And I don't know, you know, that's an interesting idea. And unfortunately, primatologists, those who study these baboons, have just have never recorded data on how they orient their bodies in the early morning hours and whether or not they vocalize uh, disproportionately at that time. So right now there's no data uh, from these animals to suggest that there's any, any strength to that idea whatsoever. But it's it's you know it's an interesting idea and it, and it may well be it may well be true. I mean that that you give us a good segue uh, uh, about the primatologist. You are considered one, right? Yes. Okay. So how did you get interested into it? If you can give, a, give us a little background into that so we can relate why you got interested in, in, in the subject and so forth. Oh, sure. Yes. Um, I, I love primates. Uh, I'm passionate about studying their behavior and their ecology. And um, and I also tend to collect uh, objects with primates, little statues or carvings or images, anything like that. And my house is decorated with lots of different uh, primate objects. And, um, and during my dissertation work, which was in Uganda, I was always looking for objects depicting primates and I struggled to find them. And, uh, and so I was very struck when I visited Egypt for the first time and I went to the Cairo Museum and there, um, primates are everywhere. You see baboons in statues. You see baboons in artwork. You see baboons in, the, there's this beautiful necklace worn by King Tut, Tutankhamun, with uh, baboons right on the chest, very large ones. And so it's just, they're, they're everywhere. And so it's just astonishing to me that um, there was such a discrepancy between Egyptian culture and other cultures. Um, and so that's what got me motivated to think about why baboons were so revered, which started, so I started to scratch the literature a little bit, scratching the surface to see to what extent they may have interacted with baboons. And that's when I realized that baboons never lived in Egypt. And yet at the same time, there are mummified baboons in Egypt, which created a mystery for me. Um, and then you start to learn about the Egyptians tell us where they get their baboons. They say we, we you know, we get our baboons from Punt. So, and then you learn that Punt is this uh, fabled and mysterious place. And so that's uh, that's when I got the idea to try to use baboons as a prism or lens for trying to triangulate on this on this Punt question. And uh, and then this paper is the result. <laughs> I don't think there's ever been a scientific study on analysis that you did. Uh, on the land of Punt, besides the, you know this fable, you know land and uh, so forth. But so you highlight the importance of baboons in, in the ancient Egyptian ventures into Punt, uh, Punt. So how would you relate their provenance to sources of light, such as uh, luxurious goods, such as aromatics? Um, do you have a specific location for their resources, maybe? Or does your research pinpoint to different 
multiple resources when it comes to beside baboons, aromatic and stuff like that. So the aromatic question is, uh, is very interesting because um, the Egyptians uh, would gather something called, um, well, they gathered myrrh. That was a, a major valuable export of punt. But there was this other thing that they called sinertur. S-N-T-R is the, the uh, conversion of, of letters to their Egyptian hieroglyphs. And because myrrh was one type of incense, many people thought sinertur was frankincense. Uh, because those two things are usually paired together. That's the main argument for Somalia, was that Somalia uh, is reported to produce the best frankincense. So it's the frankincense connection that sent many scholars down the path towards Somalia. And that's why the northern tip of Somalia is called, uh, is called Puntland. Um, but now evidence has shown that sinertur is not frankincense, but sinertur is instead a plant resin in the genus Pistacia, which is the genus that gives us pistachio nuts. And there's a, uh, a plant called Pistachia ethiopicus, which is found in Eritrea. It's also found in Ethiopia. It's right in the, um, the Afar triangle. This uh, particular tree is very common. And when you look at the, uh, the leaf arrangement of the tree, it looks identical to the uh, leaf arrangement on the trees in Queen Hatshepsut's temple. So they have, uh, she uh, imported uh, these trees, these sinertur trees, and then you see images of these trees growing on her temple. And the leaf pattern is identical. And so I think it would be very useful in terms of future research is to look at the, uh, to look more carefully at the resin produced by this tree and, and compare it with uh, resins recovered from New Kingdom tombs and see if it's a match. So I think aromatics uh, would be another really exciting uh, angle for approaching this question. There is some evidence of ebony. So if you know um, Catherine Bard at Boston University, she's been digging at a site called Mersa Gawasis in Egypt. And there they have plant remains, botanical remains, which match Eritrea, by the way. So that's one of the other main arguments for Eritrea. And they have some ebony. Uh, and so that would be tempting. It would be really nice to look at that ebony and see if it matches any of the ebony growing in that region. The problem is ebony grows across Africa has a very large distribution, much bigger than, than Hamadryas baboons. But, um, but you're right to point out that this, with, with new technologies and new tools, I think we can, we can start to analyze other products from punt, the incense, the ebony, the ivory potentially, um, maybe the gold, the metals. And if they all start to point at the same place, then that'll be really a really strong line of evidence. So were there uh, evidence that uh... The ancient Egyptians were using aromatics in their ritual uh, in honoring the baboons. What, what's the relationship between the aromatics and baboons? Oh, the, the main function of the aromatics was for their temples. So the, they, they needed the incense to burn in their temples during religious services. Uh, I think the baboons were mainly kept as royal pets. They were, they were prestige animals and they were kept in captivity to, to show off, I, I suspect. So I don't think, um, I, I think they were just both luxury products, uh, but they weren't related in any way um, for actual religious practice. Uh, the leopard skins were important for religious practice because the priests would wear mm. a leopard skin. That was the major emblem for the priest, priestly class. And so I think that was the main reason why they were exporting leopard skins from, from Punt. So how can scientific analysis like yours elaborate archeological questions beyond conjectures? Mm. Well, I think it can renew interest and, 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 and create uh, parameters for looking more carefully. I, I, the, I think the archeology span of Eritrea would be a, extremely interesting. The Dalek archipelago, there's some evidence to suggest that maybe, maybe the Egyptians actually um, uh, anchored their ships there in the archipelago, and then maybe they sent smaller craft over to the mainland. Um, I don't know. I think archaeology in, in all of that region would be, would be extremely interesting and potentially rewarding. So my hope is that this kind of research can help point the way, shine a new light on an area, uh, and excite researchers to do, to do more work in that region. So in, the, in, in this late, latest article, there were two, two things or two important things that came up, came up out in relation to future research. Uh, first of all, it mentioned that your work uh, along with your colleagues, uh, and I quote, 
uh, helps to better understand the ancient trade routes that shaped geopolitical fortunes for millennia. And of and then the uh, second point that I, I, I point uh, but was pointed out there is, and I quote, it also highlights the need for further archaeological research in Eritrea and Somalia, two areas which are currently understudied. End of quote. So, uh, if you can reply to the to the two points. Uh, so, what is this geopolitical fortunes, uh, and how would you like to see the you know the the research in Eritrea and Somalia move forward, of course, beyond COVID-19. Well, I would love to, to I'll, I'll answer the second question first, and I would love to see archaeologists, Eritrean archaeologists, digging deeper. I, my, my understanding, and you should correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, many Eritreans are working with Italian archaeologists, and that the Italians are interested in the Roman level, uh, and then they stop. And uh, I think the Eritrean researchers should maybe push them a bit to, uh, to dig deeper, that there is many interesting questions to be answered that are older than the Roman record. And so um, I would love to see that happen. If, uh, and if you, have, if you can influence some folks, that would be uh, terrific. Because I do think it'd be very rewarding. I think that the antiquity of the region is much older than, than Atlas. And uh, once you start scratching the surface, I think um, really interesting uh, finds will, will emerge. In terms of the geopolitical uh, question, the spice route was awfully important. And so European nations in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries had to go all the way around Africa because they were highly motivated to visit India and um, the Banda Islands in the Indonesian archipelago for nutmeg and cinnamon and pepper and various spices. And they were merely following in the path of Indian and Southeast Asian traders. And they were trying to cut out those middlemen because they couldn't easily access the Red Sea because of Muslim influence in the Levant and, uh, and Egypt. And so they had, that's why they had to go all the way around Africa. Uh, so my, my point is that the spice route was hugely important and it it affected political relationships and you know, colonialism is a direct result of the spice route. And the reason why I'm speaking English right now is directly resulting of the spice route and the influence of English traders and their desire to get to uh, North America. So the spice route had this incredibly and profoundly important effect on global history. And it all starts with punt. So that Egypt to punt leg is considered the very first leg in what would eventually became a trade network that is now known as the Spice Route. And so we can we can trace so much of our history and the language I'm using right now to speak with you back to that Egyptian Puntite trading relationship, which was so so um, um, mutually beneficial to both parties. Uh, though points from your research puts it in the Horn of Africa, including Yemen, parts of Yemen. What research directions do you think could narrow it down to a smaller geographic area, or is that impossible? We were very conservative in our analysis, and that's why we included Yemen in our overarching sphere of possibilities, because every area within that zone that we indicated in the paper is within one standard deviation from a match. So it's very much a statistical approach to saying anywhere in that general region, um, punt could be located. But I do think there may be approaches, complementary approaches to ours, where we could narrow it down further. And one approach might be ancient DNA. So uh, I am working with some colleagues to look at the ancient DNA uh, present in the mummified specimens to see if we can match it to populations uh, that exist in Eritrea and Ethiopia today. So you may know there's a German researcher named Dietmar Zinner, who's done a lot of work on homodryas baboons in Eritrea. And uh, so he studied their mitochondrial DNA. And we think we have a good shot at studying the same kind of DNA in the mummified animals. And then that would give us a much narrower match because then we're talking about a population of animals instead of a large geographic um, zone. There's also additional specimens in Egypt. So if possible, I would love to get permission from the Supreme Council on Antiquities in, in Egypt to study more of those specimens, uh, but that will take some negotiation. So I think additional isotopic evidence plus ancient DNA evidence could really help us. As long as we're using baboons as our primary tool, um, once you expand to other lines of evidence, then it could get you know much more interesting and 
and you could use different approaches. The hair sample you did uh, 10 years ago and the sample from, is it the same baboon or is it different? Uh, two different baboons. So the hair sample came from one animal that's on display in the museum. And then the, the tooth sample and bone sample came from a different animal that's uh, that's back in their collections. In the British Museum or? Uh, in the British Museum, yes, sorry. The British okay. Museum has two specimens. And then the, the, the Petrie Museum also in London has specimens that are uh, from the Greek and Roman period of Egyptian history. And, and those all showed evidence of living in captivity. There was no evidence of them being imported to Egypt at all. So I think at that time, the Egyptians had a captive breeding program uh, for baboons. I mean, there are other, uh, you know, cultural or, for example, in areas in Eritrea, there is a, a place called Pharaoh's uh, tomb. There were a lot of found mummified bodies. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of, a lot of connections within, you know, even in the ling linguistics um, part of it. For example, when you say, God is Ma'at, whenever for example, you say ma'at, you're saying, is, is there no justice? There are other similar things that we can look into um, yes. further to enhance uh, your research. What do you uh, envision or see in future research into the question of punt? And in your opinion, what are the drawbacks uh, that need to be bridged in trying to understand the commercial enterprise of the era? So you mentioned uh, about the, the commercial enterprise of it. So when we say globalization, whatever, so that means it's not new, right, in a sense. Yes, yes. So the land, you mentioned there was a land and, and the sea part of it. What, what happened to the land version? Because the sea, uh, you mentioned that uh, Professor Bard and uh, the late uh, Fetovich were working on it. But on the land section connection with points is uh, how, how, how would it pro progress or is there any, uh, how would it, affect the, the research that you do. There's evidence that um, the Nubians and the Puntites occasionally became allies. And so I think um, trade from Punt to Nubia could have then moved forward, northwards to, to Egypt. So I think the Egyptians recognized that there was a overland trading network through Nubia. When relationships between Egypt and Nubia soured, and uh, trade maybe became disrupted, that was the motivation to bypass Nubia and go via sea uh, on the Red Sea. The problem was that Egyptian ships were poorly suited to travel on the Red Sea because the Egyptian ships had a round-bottomed round um, hull. The, the keel had not yet been invented on ships. And so the problem, and their draft on the ship was very shallow. So the ships had a tendency to roll. And it's been argued by many scholars that there is just no way that Egyptian ships could have navigated the Red Sea because the Red Sea is far too choppy. Uh, it's, the, the waters are too rough for that kind of ship. But you probably know that one of these ships has been recreated and it was sailed on the Red Sea. And what these scholars didn't account for is that the Egyptians had very long oars on the back and the two oars essentially stabilized the ship and prevented that roll and so the ships were actually quite, quite nautically proficient and seaworthy. So I think that's what the Egyptians talk about when they talk about it being accessible by land or sea. It really depends on the political environment at the time and the level of conflict that might, uh, may or may not exist between Egypt and Nubia that determines the best way of getting to Punt. Um, so how, how was the trade that you mentioned uh... By sea with Punt through the work of the, uh, through the port in Marsaga Oasis. Yeah, how is it going to? How is it going inland? It, it was amazing because the Egyptians built their ships on the Nile River. They tested them on the Nile, and then they disassembled them, moved all the parts across the eastern desert to the Red Sea coast at Marsaga Oasis, and there at Marsaga Oasis they reassembled the ships. And then they sailed them to Punt. And they brought with them beer, uh, glass from Alexandria, uh, grain, wheat for bread. Uh, those were the main things they were sending to Punt. And then in exchange for, as you know, electrum, gold, ebony, baboons, cattle, and so on. And so all those goods would then come back to Mercer Gawasis, And then they would have to be moved from the, the coast back to what is modern day Luxor, or in, in ancient times it was called Thebes. They would have to move them across the Eastern desert. And so the logistics of all this are just, are just mind boggling. I mean, cattle, how do you move cattle 
easily over water, first of all. And then how do you move them over the desert from the coast to to Luxor? Because cattle need to drink a lot of water every day. That would be, and you got to feed them. So, I mean, these were tremendous challenges that they solved. Some people have argued that there must have been a canal that connected the Nile River to the Red Sea and that maybe they just moved things on ships by tugging them uh, along this canal. But until evidence of that is found, um, that remains just, you know, just conjecture. But uh, yeah, no, the logistics of it all are just are just boggling. I don't know the practicalities of moving these animals alive over these distances and then over the over the eastern desert. Uh, yeah, tremendously challenging. So uh, the the boats that they make wouldn't it make it wouldn't it make it different to you know what's on the on the Nile River and the Red Sea, which is like I don't know forty percent salt or forty five percent salt. So they they, they made the, the the boats both for the river water and then the ocean? Is it different, different water or not? I don't know. They, apparently they were the same, that they had a single style of boat technology mm-hmm. and they used them for both, both waters. Um, oh, so sorry. to my knowledge, there was no obvious difference between the maritime ships and then the Nile ships. Uh, mm-hmm. They were essentially the same. And we do have a good sense of their boat technology because they made so many model boats that they buried in temples and tombs um, for use in the afterlife. So we, their, their ships are fairly well documented in terms of their construction and, and their, their seaworthiness. Well, you mentioned uh, strontium isotopes. Can you explain to us what is the ratio of strontium isotopes in the samples you had helped uh, you to reach the geochemical signature for our region? Strontium is radioactive. So um, one of the isotopes will decay, spontaneously spin off, uh, leaving a a difference in the ratio between the heavier and the lighter strontium isotope. And so older rocks will have a very different strontium ratio than younger rocks. And so the prevailing bedrock under you right now is determining the strontium ratios that are entering the food web. So as that rock erodes and forms soil, then that strontium ratio is taken up in the plants, it exists in the water, and then the animals eat those plants and then other animals eat those animals. And so that strontium ratio, principally from the bedrock, uh, creeps its way into the food web. So that's, uh, that's how it works. So you can take a geological map and you can predict pretty carefully, pretty relatively accurately, what the strontium composition will be of the plants and animals that were growing on that form of, on that basic piece of bedrock. Now, the geology of Eritrea is fairly complicated. <laughs> um, and so um, it creates some noise then in our strontium ratios. But um, the, the, the valuable thing for us was that the geology of Eritrea is radically different than the geology of Egypt. The bedrock in Egypt is totally different in terms of its strontium composition than the bedrock of Eritrea and Ethiopia. So that was um, those geological differences between those two places is really what allows us to match animals from from different places. Dr. Agamedi, so he has this this saying I always use it, and he says Eritrean history is as old as humanity, mm-hmm. based on his the research that he's doing and so forth. So the connection that the uh, land of Punt had with uh, ancient Egypt is very important. Uh, the role of ancient Egypt in mm-hmm. Civilization is very important, and so forth. So I think uh, you know your your work in that area is highly appreciated and and, and welcomed. So I think uh, you, your work should be um, extended to to Eritrea and, and Somalia and, and so forth. Yeah. So the the DNA that you said could be one of the solution. How would it be done? How would you? How do you envision that? Well, we have um, a few bone fragments left from some of the mummified baboons. Uh, I think we have six bone fragments that are large enough that we we can get some mitochondrial DNA, which is you know far more far more abundant than nuclear DNA. Um, so I think we can then match that to existing mitochondrial data for baboons across Eritrea and Ethiopia. And, and and Yemen, and um, and uh, the, the, you know they could give us a match, and then that would be pretty pretty telling, I think. Um, 
how many kinds of baboons are there? And I, I know you mentioned there's six. And why did you narrow to hide? What is the name? Hide. Uh, we call it the Hamadryas baboon. Hamadryas, yeah. Or, or the sacred baboon because because the Egyptians thought it was sacred. Um, uh -huh. um, yeah, that well, that baboon is so distinctive. It's so physically different from other baboons that um, when we see it mummified in in Egypt it's obvious to us that it's different from other types of baboons. So I think for a primatologist, it's just really clear that the Egyptians were targeting a particular species of baboon. And that species has a very narrow geographic distribution, which for a primatologist narrows down punt right away and you know, would clearly rule out places like Mozambique or or, or Uganda, or even Sumatra. Some people have argued for Sumatra. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, so I mean, just from the primatological perspective, um, we can rule out some of those places uh, right away. Um, so I think the real interesting question is between Yemen, Eritrea, and maybe Somalia, because that's, that baboon lives in those three areas. Uh, and so from just purely based on the type of primate we're dealing with, those are the three competing candidate sites, I think. And so it was, it was good that our data confirmed that, uh, mm -hmm. because if our data pointed to some other region of Africa, then that would be pretty puzzling. Mm -hmm. So why, why these particular places? I mean, is it a... This baboon, oh, it's well adapted to relatively arid conditions. So it can survive uh, under much higher temperatures. Um, it sweats less, it pants less. It's just um, more tolerant to heat than the um, the olive baboon, um, which uh, which which you find in Ethiopia. Mm. So once you're at the Awash Falls, from uh, everything west of the Awash Falls is the olive baboon, and when you're east of the Awash Falls, it's the Hamadryas baboon. So the Awash Falls is the major um, boundary between those two types of baboons. If you look at their their butts, um, they have very large butt pads. Uh, we, we call those ischial callosities. And they're extremely large on the Hamadryas baboon. Yeah, and they're red and they're brightly colored. So, and, and the, the males, by the way, have a much larger penis than those of the Anubis yeah. baboons, the olive baboons. So, you know, I, there's, even though they can interbreed freely and produce hybrid, viable hybrid populations. So some scholars think they're the same species and they're actually only different at the subspecies level. The fact is, physically, they look totally different. Colors are different, their size is different, their teeth are different, and all these other characteristics are, are, are you know, profoundly different. When we see a mummified animal in Egypt, we, we can easily tell which one it is, but the Egyptologists sort of lump them together and they don't really distinguish between them. <laughs> which was a, oh. I always found puzzling <laughs> because I think they're so different. But. <laughs>